Yeah. Well, welcome everyone. Um, we're going to be talking about ambivalent ancestors over the next week. And I think this is a particularly, uh, I don't know, wonderful topic for us as we inch our way towards All Saints, beginning here on All Hallows Eve, where uh, for a long time, the, the Christian tradition and other traditions have had some kind of day where they talk about the threshold between the living and the dead being thin. Um, and this, this week for us in the Christian tradition is, is when we particularly think about that, um, thinking about how those who have gone before us have not only shaped who we are as people, our identity, um, but also have given us a glimpse of, of what, it, what it means to live a faithful life. And so over the next couple of weeks, Lyndon and I will, will be talking about ancestors and saints uh, in the context of Genesis. Um, and so I, I do want to start this morning actually bringing up the collect for us, for all saints, and thinking and, and reading that together. So the Lord be with you. And also with you. Let us pray. Almighty God, you have knit together your elect in one communion and fellowship in the mystical body of your son. Give us grace so to follow your blessed saints in all virtuous and godly living that we may come to those ineffable joys that you have prepared for those who truly love you. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who with you and the Holy Spirit lives and reigns one God in glory everlasting. Amen. So I want to take just a few minutes and, and think about with you what stands out to you in this prayer. Um, I have a few things that I want to particularly pull out, but I'm going to hand it over to you all just to talk back to me a little bit about, about what stands out to you. The obvious thing to me is that this path that we're we're walking has been trod before <laughs> by uh, by many, and um, that um, we can learn um, from those stories. Yeah, the other language that to me that's so interesting is the language of knitting together in one communion um, and fellowship. And this is on All Saints Day. So, so the blessed saints are, are those who are dead. So it's, it's very interesting, a very interesting theological move to say that we are knit together in communion with the dead. Um, I think the thing that that stood out to me and I got over it because the whole prayer is really pretty good. It says you have knit together your elect. And yeah, I did thought, you notice that I left that part out, Barbara? Yes. Uh, and I thought, whoops, um, <laughs> what does that mean? And have I been elected? And, it, you know, I mean, I guess I could say by virtue of baptism or all of that kind of thing, but, but the word elect makes me, um, I guess a little curious. The rest of the prayer is lovely and I believe it, you know, but but that elect kind of stood in my way for a little bit. Well, I think Barbara, we need to know if this prayer was written before or after Calvin. Hmm. Well, because you know it's really Calvin who really Yeah, well, uh, it sure. I know that. I know that. <laughs> but even so, we've kept it there, right? And 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 so that it just it's just, you know, Calvin bothers me too. So, <laughs> so the, you know, I mean, and, and whether yeah. we had any say in, in, in who we are and how we are, and we do have say, I believe. So it, it just stopped me for a little yeah, bit. Yeah, yeah. So, so maybe the question is like, who are the elect? Who are in this communion? Mm -hmm. And of course, the answer is everybody. Um, 
And so I have a problem with this, this elect word as well. And I do mm -hmm. wish that our prayers and our liturgy would reflect. <clears throat> um, but, you know, there are some people in the church that believe that there is an elect. Um, but being a good Trinitarian Universalist, I, I don't like that language. Um, so, um, yeah. yeah, so there's, I think there's a way, you're right, Paul, where this can be read as those who have in some ways, uh, either through baptism or through an expression of faith or belief, um, joined themselves to, to God in Christ. Um, but there's another way we can read it, and that that is that the elect is is something that that uh, in the end of time or an eschatological idea, where where everyone will be gathered into the love of God, um, and it, and already is gathered into the love of God in in some senses, um, and so so it has an it has another element perhaps uh, there as well. Right. The other text I want to look at, which we use a lot. Oh, can I can I just say? Oh, one yeah, thing? yeah, yeah, absolutely. Well, I had to look up ineffable joys and <laughs> and I really liked the it was too great to be expressed in words. And I thought that was nice. Mm -hmm. Yeah, something beyond language. Now, now, sorry, go on. <laughs> No, no, I think that's worth that's worth pointing out. Um, but yeah, the other texts uh, that we talk use a lot. Oop, that skipped too far ahead. Um, use a lot when we talk about saints and ancestors is is the one from the beginning of Hebrews twelve. Yeah. Therefore, since we are surrounded by a great cloud of witnesses. Let us throw off everything that hinders and the sin that so easily entangles and let us run with perseverance the race marked out for us. So again, there is something that this cloud of witnesses, um, which, are, which are named in Hebrews as um, a, lot of the, a lot of the patriarchs and matriarchs in another part of the book, um, that, that their presence with us, their, their being with us, allows us to do things we might not otherwise be able to do. Throwing off the sin that entangles and running the race marked out before us. So I wanna propose in this session at least that our ideas about saints are really caught up in our notions about what constitutes a faithful life. Um, how does that sit? We can sit in silence. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I'm, well fine I really... with the, I'm fine with that, <clears throat> with that language. <clears throat> um, it doesn't diminish um, people who are not saints. Um, <laughs> gosh, help me out. <laughs> I think you're going where I'm going, though, Paul. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, <clears throat> It's like um, God loves all of us equally, um, but some of us are more aware of that than others, maybe, and we feel called to live a life that is faithful to a deeply explored um, vision um, of God. Yeah, yeah, so who, who are the, I mean, who are the saints, who are the elect? who are ancestors. Um, so I have this slide up that just simply says saints versus ancestors. Um, is there something unique we can say about the saints or about ancestors that, that break up these categories? Like, or, or, or is it false? Is it a false category? I, well, I, I, on the Go ahead, somebody. Well, well I, I guess I was sort of thinking of maybe 
saints in the way if I think I'm behaving a certain way and or I would think well say like my mother who I had a very close relationship and uh, I would say like well gee what would my mother think but then there being other people who are just you know it's sort of like like someone that you are measuring your behavior or what what you might how how you should react or how you should behave and think of those people the people you're trying to measure up to or you would value the way they would behave instead of just other people that have passed on i don't know if that makes sense or not yeah yeah is is the distinction a reduction to just behavior what someone does or doesn't do in their life sort of in theory i should be maybe you know thinking you know what what would god you know uh sort of i guess maybe thinking of these you know people ahead uh, instead of god i could be looking at God is what God would want me to do, but that almost seems too hard. <laughs> well, certainly I, I, behavior has, <clears throat> behavior is really, really, really important. Um, I mean, there's what's in our hearts and what's in our minds and brains, but usually our behavior kind of reflects that. And, um, you know, there is evil in the world, so um there are definitely people who we would consider as as not saints um evil exists you know um, mm -hmm. but there is evil in every one of us oh, absolutely yeah absolutely right. so who who is and is not i mean how much evil does it take to be not <laughs> <a saint? laughs> that's great sir yeah, and and you said, Paul, we would not think of as good people, right? And right. That, that's important. We would not. And I know this is a title, um, Nicole, but see, I want you to take the capitalization off of both saints and ancestors because a capital S can mean, for me, can mean people like saint paul and saint peter and saint all of those who talk about having their foibles did in the same with ancestors you know and so to make it less um they're just the important ones or the ones we think of as important who and sometimes we don't know on either one of them how how faithful they were because we didn't think they were faithful. It didn't seem like they were faithful, but we didn't know the whole story. Right. Yeah. And once the saints are um, something, uh, an institution of the church um, declares, uh, yeah. and in another sense, um, who's to know? You know, I mean, uh, Winnie Varghese in a sermon like two weeks ago, she said, you may think you know, who your fellow sheep in the sheep pen are, but you'll be wrong. Yeah. <laughs> um. Katie, Katie Peterson did a um, a good uh, a presentation. She was talking about death and about the saints that when we were talking to the Ismaili group uh, yesterday, and she said that um, the the term saints in maybe other maybe other churches saints are this defined group of people as we know like saint paul saint peter blah 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 but we have in the our church we have those saints but those are just named named saints but the saints include everybody i mean they're they're all the people who have gone before us and we don't really distinguish saints versus non-saints i thought that was sort of an interesting way to to put it. Yeah, yeah. And I think I think that point, and I think, you know, the point that Paul brings up is worth thinking about a little bit more because um, you know, Sherry, you you were talking about, well, how much evil is too much evil. Um, but the other question is like, who decides, right? Like Paul said, the institutional church. Well, 
who is that? Who decides who are the saints and ancestors? So I have another another thing to just kind of help us a little bit more. Um, you can you can see here that I think these are the things they have in common, right? They're they're chosen, but they're also inherited. We we definitely don't choose uh, all the saints. <laughs> Some of them we've just inherited. Um, they're all they've all passed. They're all in the near presence of Jesus. And I want to say that they're all ambivalent. Sometimes we want to put saints over here in this exemplary, uh, that they have exemplary lives. So we want to add this maybe to the saint side. Um, and we want to say that, well, maybe ancestors aren't always publicly recognized. Um, but I think, I think that these two are related in that um, this is really through somebody's sort of arbitrary or informed or wise um, use of power. Um, so, so I just want to sit with that. And, and you all feel free to tell me, tell me that there are other things than this Venn diagram that should be on each of these sides or, or is it as ambivalent as Linda and I might be suggesting it is? Can you expand a little bit on the word ambivalent? Yeah, ambivalent is is means that it's a it's hugely complicated. Yes. <laughs> it's a, okay. It's of one thing and another. Uh, you neither feel this way nor that way. It's neither good nor bad. It's it's sort of both mingled and intertwined. Right, which it always is. Mm -hmm. um, well, but that's not to say that it's arbitrary. Yeah, I'm not sure. Could be. You know, I find it interesting in a lot of our, our saint, the name saints were determined in the Catholic Church. And their way of deciding who's a saint, you know, they they had this these criteria. And you know, one is um some sort of miracle and so they sit around and they try to find like mother Teresa. they sat around and tried to figure okay let's come up with a miracle and they work very hard and somebody makes up this something and you know to get a saint in or and sometimes it's made up and sometimes it's it's mm -hmm. something that really doesn't have a whole lot to do with the person uh, you know, it's just to, because they, they really want that person to be a saint. And so that you have to tick all the boxes. Yeah. Right. Um, I, would add, <clears throat> um, I would add family um, because um, I think, because people talk about praying to the saints. Um, but frankly, when I'm up against it, it's rare that I would pray to Mother Teresa or to St. Peter or St. Paul. But when I'm up against it, I pray to my mother and my grandmother. And so I would say not only near in the presence of Jesus, but near in the presence to ourselves um, and people who have had a great impact on our lives. Um, and, you know, and so I, I ask them to intercede for me. Um, and praying, is praying just talking to, or, you know, what is praying? Yeah, well, praying for me is, is, is definitely, uh, is intercession um, for some things I'm really concerned about that's happening in my life. Asking for my ancestors to intervene or to give me guidance in some way. So it is definitely uh, verbal. When we talk about communion of saints and we've skirted around it in everything that we talked about. And when I think about the communion of saints, I don't think about just, again, St. Peter and St. Paul. They're, 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 there's that. There is that. Mm -hmm. But then there are those who have gone before. And the older I get, and therefore the more family, particularly family, but friends and that kind of thing who have gone before me becomes very important. I didn't grow up with the notion of communion of saints. This was not because I, you know, I wasn't. But I believe it strongly. And I believe it's more strongly the older I get. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, so to cycle back 
to the initial question. Can we say anything different of saints than we can say of, of ancestors? Hmm. Yeah. Well, there are people whose stories resonate with us in a special kind of way. Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, I don't come out of a tradition and <clears throat> here in the Episcopal Church in my adult years, I haven't really been exposed a lot to praying uh, th through the saints or to the saints to intercede. And um, <clears throat> I'm, I'm just really enjoying thinking about that and um, that maybe that is an opportunity for prayer <clears throat> that I haven't explored. And for me, prayer is just, is just kind of what we do as a result of being in a relationship you know, mm -hmm. uh, with God. So, um, um, yeah, what I, what I want to tease out of that and also an earlier comment you made, Paul, is that, you know, you said, well, certainly not arbitrary. And I think there's a way we can think of the word arbitrary as just random. Um, but I think the use that I want to recover is this use of agency, this use uh, of power, whether individually or collectively, that in some senses, uh, when we remember specific folks, whether they uh, are a saint that is also remembered or highlighted by the church, um, we're, we're choosing them. We're, we're using our agency or a connection that we feel um, to remember them in a specific sort of way, to pray to them in a particular kind of way, um, because we seek a resonance, um, perhaps maybe even through the Holy Spirit, if you will, um, that, that something is happening in and among and between us um, and, a, and a saint or an ancestor. Um, so I do want to do just a little breakout room, like to pair you up. And I'd love it if you'd share about a saint or an ancestor who has deeply influenced you. Um, what about them is exemplary and what about them is ambivalent? And I'm gonna give you about five minutes uh, to do this. And let's see, there's 11 of us. So we'll make, all right. Um, And check out that art piece of the cloud of witnesses. Oops. All right, see you in a bit. Peter and Julia, do you see the uh, invitation to join the breakout room on your screen? Uh, Nicole, I'm, <clears throat> I'm watching off, off video. Uh, I've just come in on the conversation, so I think I'll, I'll simply listen to others Okay, today I, I, I put have you in a breakout tell, room, but, but I was the, just taking your partner no, back. No, no, but I, that you're very good of you to to invite us in. Thank you. Um, Jerry, well, I was in breakout room four, but I was the only one. Right, Peter was. I was. I sent Peter to 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 be with you, but uh, they're they're on a different device or something, so the three of us can just talk. Um, okay. So go ahead, share with us your ambivalent saint or ancestor, Sherry. Oh, um, my father. Uh, my father is, I and mean, he had a whole lot of faults, but he also had a lot of goodness. I mean, I, I, I um, you know, he, he wasn't known, 
I guess he wasn't really known for his goodness. Uh, he was known for his, he was gruff sometime with the, with the kids and I mean, with the, the family, I mean, he, I mean, never, I mean, he never struck us or anything, but you know, he, he, if he got mad, you know, he would her growl and people were afraid until you got used to it. But um, he had other faults I won't go into, but I can, I remember one thing that, that struck me that I never thought about when he was, he had a car he was going to sell and somebody came and looked at the car and said, oh, I'll buy it for this amount of, you know, whatever amount of money they agreed. And the guy went away to get the money and somebody else showed up and said, oh, I want this car. I'll give you this amount of money, which was a lot more. And he could have just gotten that. And he said, no, I already promised. I gave my word to this other person and I have to wait for him to come back. And that, you know, I learned something that from that, that it just never occurred to me that, you know, I was at, a, I was at an age where, where, you know, what, what is right was just forming in my mind. Yeah. Yeah. And that made a big impression on me. Yeah. I also have an, an, an uncle and I will, I will say this because it, this is one that has always stuck with me. Uh, my mother was one of nine and, and one of her brothers was an alcoholic and he, stayed, he was a farmer in South Alabama and um, probably not a very good farmer, uh, but a pretty good alcoholic. And he, um, you know, people thought about him as, in various ways and he knew all the moonshiners, but he was the, when it came to racial relations, I mean, he was a solid person. When he died, you know, every black person who knew him came to pay their respects. And uh, I remember one said, well, there's a good man gone. Mm -hmm. And he was, he taught me a whole lot. So that's, that's me. Yeah. And the recognized saints, uh, St. Ignatius has been someone that has been important for me um, and Ignatian spirituality. And I think from the ancestor side, uh, Sherry, I can join you in um, talking about my grandfather who uh, was really present to me and almost a father figure uh, growing up. But um still is really unsupportive of, of the, the way that I have chosen to go um, mm -hmm. um, and is not supportive of, of women and ministry at all. And, um, you know, and, and has been uh, unkind to, to uh, lots of, of uh, folks because of that. Um, so ambivalent, ambivalent. Right. I'm gonna call uh, everyone back to us. In just a minute, I'll be here in 55 seconds. <laughs> Not to be precise. I didn't realize that all. It kicks you out once it gives you that minute warning. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Jerry, do you have a saint that is recognized by the church that particularly is? Um, not, not really. I, I just don't. Um, I always had trouble with church saints of the church hmm. for reasons that I had given. Welcome back, everyone. It's it's good to see you again. Um, so I'm wondering if, if anyone would like to share just briefly, we'll, we'll just promise to make 
one minute comments. Um, but I'm curious if we can if we can think of uh, or collect any themes from your reflections together. What did you hear yourself say or notice other your partner saying um, that you felt like was significant to our conversation so far? Well, Martha talked about her great grandfather and, and thought, you know, sort of as thinking about saints. And then we also talked about not having been raised in that tradition of saints, the way Catholics are uh, um, raised. And she said that she had been looking up uh, St. Pius X, because she would be at that school. It was like they would pray for, you know, Pius X. And she was like, who is this guy? <laughs> uh, which was interesting. And then there was a woman who went to Epiphany years ago, and she was an older woman, and she had an aunt who became a saint sure. because she was... Uh, she was Jewish, but she was still and converted to Catholicism and then died in uh, one of the, the camps in Germany. Mm -hmm. And then she was made a saint. Mm -hmm. which I remember, was who like, was that woman? Wally I can't Stein remember. was, you know. Wally uh, Stein, that's yes, it. I knew Wally Stein's aunt, yeah. I knew right. Wally years ago at St. Luke's. Um, oh, yeah, now I remember her. Yeah, yeah, right. Wally Stein. I, I remember her. I don't remember the name of her aunt, though. Um, I don't either. To say. She, she, she'd become a nun, you know, yeah, she was, yeah. She, was oh. you know, she was she was born uh, and she was Jewish um, and, and she became a nun, yeah. This was this was Wally Stein's aunt and she died in a concentration camp and she, she became a saint. Um, but I don't remember her name. I don't remember the name of her aunt. Well, you know, there's different levels for, to becoming a saint. And what I remember was Wally was able to go to Rome when her aunt was be, was, at, was at the, I don't know, a first or second level. And I don't remember now what that was called. But I remember. A canonization process. Yes. Yes. Yeah. Beatification. And then. There you yeah. go, Lyndon. Yeah. <laughs> teach us, Lyndon. Teach us. <laughs> The process, which gives me a little, makes me cringe a little. <laughs> yeah. So I promised we were gonna look at some art, and I do wanna do wanna show you this. Oop, I don't know what that. Sorry, I don't, what happened there? It's the wrong button. Um, but I, I want to show us this image. This is done by uh, Shin Ming, who in in twenty twenty one in response to the uh, actually the shootings here in Atlanta. And what's so significant to me about this image is how uh, Shin is playing with, with both the idea of saint and the idea of ancestors. You see how they're, they're mixing, uh, mm -hmm. mixing here. Um, so we can just point out some initial observations either in the chat or, or just um, in discussion. We'll, we'll revisit this at the end too, but wanted to at least do some foreshadowing with this image. So what, what do you notice? Well, that they're weeping. And, weeping. and I think that is part of, is that uh, saints do weep for the world. And in this case, a particular incident, apparently. Halos. Mm -hmm. You see right. the halos of the saints. <laughs> yes. The smallest, and, yes. The smallest one does not have the weeping. Is that right? Or That's correct. That's appear correct. to be, but okay. is pouring out water. Mm -hmm. um, oh, yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, that middle one might represent Jesus too, a type of Jesus, because you see the the wrist for the. Yeah, I was just looking at that. Right. Yeah, the stigmata both 
in this top figure and oh yeah i see the, it too uh, i noticed them only in the middle middle figure but i see them now in the top yeah figure as well. yeah, yeah. As well. yeah. yeah it's sort of hard to see but you can also see on the robes there's also uh women who are weeping here mm. oh really oh, okay well, and uh, Nicole, as you know, I always like when there's images of women <laughs> and saintly yeah, <laughs> faces. It's been, it's been saintly women, I ancestors here. Yeah, great. Well, I wanted to to show you this just because I think it's it's doing the very mixing and blending of this idea of of saint and ancestor. Um, here's some more pictures. The, you know, we call the narratives in, in Genesis the ancestral narratives. Um, and, and folks have done a lot of art throughout the ages uh, depicting these scenes. Um, and I could spend all day talking to you all about the meaning of their representation. I mean, we have the, the very sort of abstract figures from the early 2000s. Here's uh, Harmonia Rosales who, who's who titles this piece the birth of Eve, um, and and you see how this uh, sort of reinterpretation has a woman as God here, and then a daughter who is born as Eve. Um, here, Adam and Eve by uh, Edvard Moon. I don't even know how to say this last name, so y'all can help me. Um, Monk. Yeah. Or whatever who you know this this very turn of the century <laughs> in the 20th century <laughs> was on the expressionist you know era um again a more recent uh and uh depiction here and then and then this image of abraham and and isaac up here in sort of the classical medieval um genre but um lyndon i'm wondering if you want to go ahead and walk us through sure. this Next slide. Sure. So um, in talking about the ancestral narratives in Genesis, um, we just wanted to go over a few um, aspects of the biblical text and um, how we approach it. And so one of the first considerations is the genre of the text that we're looking at. Um, and in the ancestral narratives, um, etiological stories or etiologies are a big part um, of the way that the, the stories are presented to us, um, it, which refers to stories um, that whose function is to explain um, an origin of a name, a place, or um, in particular, re a religious custom. Um, and so some of the things that we come up against in the text in Genesis can be, um, you know, it can have that kind of a feeling or be a little bit odd and we might wonder why that's in there. And so that's something to keep in mind. Um, another aspect of that is that these stories um, circulated for centuries as oral traditions before they were eventually written down into the text um, that we have today in Genesis. And so there's um, the stories come from different traditions from um, within Israel's uh, broader history. Um, so they're, they're fragmentary and then they're sewn together in a narrative um, it, that in which the stories are not always deployed for the original um, use that they might have functioned in those oral traditions. Um, and then ultimately what we have is a bunch of um, interlocking family histories um, that tell the story of who Israel's ancestors are and therefore inform who Israel sees itself to be. And then we inherit that um, as Christians and uh, is stories of our own family history. Um, and something else to note is that we all receive these through a history of interpretation, which means that we receive these stories through the lens of other people who have received these stories going back um, and, and who the people were and um, their point of view influence how they characterize these stories and how they pass them on to us. And so how we receive them, how we read them and the meanings that we we hold within them. Um, 
And then finally, I just wanted to touch on the idea of hermeneutics, which is like the lens through which we interpret these stories um, in a, from a theological, theological perspective. Um, and, and one important aspect of that is that when we open the Bible or when we look at biblical stories, we expect to meet God in the text um, and have a spiritual experience with those in ways that we don't necessarily when we open a different kind of a text or um, engage with a different kind of a story. And so that also affects um, what we expect to get out of the story and how we relate to it. Wow. Very helpful overview. Any questions before we move on? Okay, so we're gonna look actually at a, at a couple of texts and we're gonna breeze by this faster than I wish we had to because um, we're nearing at 11 and so have about 15 more minutes in us. But here's some questions that I'm interested in us bringing to these stories. And, and you all know these stories, everyone who's gathered here, I know has a familiarity already, um, but I'm curious, what if anything is the author or the authors of these stories wanting to say about living a faithful life? Um, what can be said of human agency in this story? What can be said about divine agency in this story? And what are the areas are of most ambivalence in this story? Um, so we're gonna start when humans enter the scene, God created humans and in Genesis three, we meet Adam and Eve and we meet this serpent character. Um, so we're gonna read this together and think about this together. Is there somebody who might be interested in, in reading these verses for us? I'll read it. Um, now the serpent was more crafty than any other beast of the field that the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, did God actually say you shall not eat of any tree in the garden? And the woman said to the serpent, we may eat of the fruit of the trees in the garden, but God said you shall not eat of the fruit of the tree that is in the midst of the garden, neither shall you touch it lest you die. But the serpent said to the woman, you will not surely die, for God knows that when you eat of it, your eyes will be opened and you will be like God, knowing good and evil. So when the woman saw that the tree was good for food and there was a delight to the eyes and that the tree was to be desired to make one wise, she took of its fruit and ate. And she also gave some to her husband who was with her and he ate. Then the eyes of both were opened and they knew that they were naked and they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves loincloths. And they heard the sound of the Lord God walking in the garden in the cool of the day. And the man and his wife hid themselves in the presence of the Lord God among the trees of the garden. But the Lord God called to the man and said to him, where are you? And he said, I heard the sound of you in the garden and I was afraid because I was naked and I hid myself. He said, who told you that you were naked? Have you eaten of the tree of which I commanded you not to eat? The man said, the woman whom you gave to be with me, she gave me the fruit of the tree and I ate. Then the Lord God said to the woman, what is this that you have done? The woman said, the serpent deceived me and I ate. The Lord God said to the serpent. To the I put the woman, dots there because yeah, yeah. The, the, that, that is when the Lord offers all the curses, which I think we all know, but I'm speaking the Lord, said to the woman and then said to Adam. Notice how Adam gets a name here, but the woman is just a woman. <laughs> um, so what is this text, you know, throughout time and history of reception going about? What, what, what is this text primarily? What has it in the history of Christianity? What has it been about? What has been used for to explain? What etiology? 
how did sin get here, right? <laughs> how, did, how did it all start? Right. That there was a point uh, at which um, uh, there was, was there was a point at which we there was a, a purity, I suppose, that we were without sin. So um, it's and we through our disobedience. Um, um, we became kind of who we are today. <laughs> um, I mean, that's the, and I love the the image of the snake. I mean, a talking snake just as a um, literary uh, device is, is a very cool thing. Uh, it's also to say how maybe the story is trying to say how, when they wrote the story, how we became who we are now. And even though you left off the curses, um, it's that mm, not everybody, but most people are afraid of snakes. A lot of people are afraid of snakes. Let me put it that way. And pain in childbirth, even down to pain in childbirth, and that you've got to work for a living. And so that story encompasses a lot of whoever wrote it down, whom a bunch that wrote it down said, how did we get where we are now when God said everything was good when he created us and gave us the garden and told us not to do this and we did it anyway? And it's sort of the human, for, the hum, humanity, the humanness of yeah. where well, we and the, yeah. the human, um, I mean, in, in many ways, Adam and Eve are adolescents. And how often isn't it for adolescents through disobedience that they get wisdom? <laughs> you know, that, um, I, I I don't know, I, and I I can't, I can't remember right now, but um, Muslims view this story very differently because um, they really see it as uh, wisdom being brought uh, to the people mm -hmm. uh, through the snake. Mm -hmm. And of course, the truth is that what the snake said was true. Um, which uh, that's always surprises me about that story, um, but but it's I think you're right, Barbara. The way it was written to explain a whole lot about human existence, and I think it's still true. I think if we uh, took this story to Matt and the youth, they'd be able to tell us lots of uh, lots of stories about. Yeah. Um, that's really interesting, Ellen. Are... I I you know that puts a different spin on it than the way I usually think of this story. Um, as um, not only disobedience, but as an example of how we are not, we are overreaching out of our vocation. <laughs> you know, our vocation is humans. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, we are human, we're not God. And um, so, um, you know, it's it's an attempt to, what what the thing that, that causes this disobedience is this notion that uh, you can you can be like God, you know, um, and um, you know, God is God and humans are humans. And, and I mean, there is a sense in which we are kind of co-creators and we are given agency and all of that, but. Um, there is an overreach, you know, there is a, there is a, there is a not realizing of who we are in this. Um, I think that's well said. And I think that this text really, really is showing us uh, the power of human agency um, that I, I know lots of folks are signing off because they're going to come to church, but <laughs> we'll keep, we'll keep yeah. going ahead and they can tune back in if they want on the recording. Um, but, but the human agency is powerful. And I think that this text is demonstrating that, that in the midst of God creating this world in this garden, like humans are acting too, and those actions have consequence. Um, another, another text that uh, we won't read, but that we'll just go over is actually in, in the next chapter when we meet Cain and Abel. 
um, and they offer their offerings, um, if you remember. And one, uh, one is accepted and one is not. And somehow <laughs> one of them gets mad and kills the other. Um, and I am failing to pull up and talk at the same time the PowerPoint again. So just give me a second here. And then we get to, so this is in, in, the, in the very next chapter, the next 17 verses. And what I want to pull out is at the, at the end here, um, God's response to this act of violence um, is that he says, I'm going to put a mark on you, <laughs> lest anyone find you and attack you. And then Cain goes away and is, has a family and is integrated into a city and is able to have a communion um, again, both with family and both with others. So what's fascinating to me at the, at, at, about this is that the mark which God uh, puts on Cain like negates in some senses the legitimacy of both the murder and the, and the violence to avenge the murder. So the sovereignty at work in the city is not dependent alone on human violence and it's not structured by it, but on the divine negation of the spiral of families violence. So here you have God who is acting in some ways to protect Cain and Cain's legacy. Um, and so the agency of God is really highlighted even in the midst of human disobedience and human sin. And I just think, I think that's fascinating to have both of those texts uh, juxtaposed to one another right there in the beginning of Genesis. Um, as if to say to us, um, you know, the saints really, we think about their exemplary actions, but we also should be thinking about the exemplary actions of God in the midst um, of our lives and of the saints and the lives of the ancestors, so. And this is one sense in which, uh, another sense in which we don't get what we might think that we deserve. Uh, and that we are delivered from what we deserve um, by, so that, that speaks to what God's will is for us, you know, not to spiral into un unending violence, you know, um, right. even though that might seem to, <clears throat> to our, our standards somewhat unjust uh, in a sense um. yeah yeah that maybe god's judgment and god's grace are more intertwined than we often think yeah. any other reflections before we uh we'll go back to the image i want to read you the artist statement um and then we'll end i did the only thing i was was where where Adam is sort of like, oh, that woman made me do it. And then, then Eve is going, oh, that snake made me do it. And sort of people didn't really want to, you know. Yeah, they didn't want to. Yeah. Right. It, <laughs> it is was like, but, but Ellen I feel so, seen. Sort of like, I feel seen, Jeanette. Yes. I like yes. they were, I'll you know, uh, like, um, you know, adolescents, which was, you know, like you have to accept, you know, accept your responsibility. But I just, that was what one thing I got yeah so go on sorry no no that's a really important point I'm glad you made it for us there's so much more we can talk about um here's Shen's uh, image again and I'm just going to read you the statement that he writes about it he says I am a Korean American historically cream white was the robe of mourning worn by Koreans at funerals. And that is what the woman at the top is wearing over my take on a hambo there, which is the traditional robes that um, Koreans wear, Korean women wear. There are lamenting faces woven into the collar of her robe. Her arms are outstretched around her mother who appears in the traditional hairstyle of Korean queens. Mama ironically means your majesty in Korean. The grandmother wears the gold red robes that were reserved for kings, a rightful honoring of her womanhood and protest against the invalidation, misogyny and oppression so many Korean and Asian women by their 
own brother's and father's experience. My wife and I grew up with Asian pastors and leaders. We honor you. The grandmother has her arms outstretched around her granddaughter who holds a cup full of tears that flow down her mother's face and down her grandmother's face and cascades out as they pour onto the ground. There are no tears on the little one's face, which looks up with hope, but the tears are an offering of prayer, pain, and love, the love of mothers who sacrifice for the sake of their future families. It is a plea and a prayer for help of women of faith who have kept the family knit together in their preserving and too often suffering love, persevering and too often suffering love. Um, how interesting is it that Shin uses the language of knit together? Um, that was not the right button again, sorry. Button problems today. Uh, that was uh, that was beautiful, and um, um, you know, pain is inextricably bound up with love. Um, to love is to risk loss. Yeah, and so over the next couple of weeks, um, Lyndon will be leading us. Next time we're together, but we'll we'll talk. We'll look at another couple of texts and some more art together and really asking the question together about how we hold these stories, not only of saints, but also of ancestors. Um, and I think that that is just such really well said, Paul. Um, what what are the things, what are the ways in which we hold one another and hold the community of saints um, together? What capacities, what skills do we have in the church and in ourselves? Um, that allow us to be honest about both of the pain um, and the grace that, that we experience uh, in our interconnected lives and, and ways of being in the world. So anything else you want to say, Lyndon, before we close here? No, I just, um, I, I love that image as well. And I think that I, something that stands out to me about it is just the, the way in which our, it shows our humanity is not just within ourselves, but it's contained in, you know, the prayers of people who went before us and, and our hopes for those who come after us. And um, I think that's something that's just beautifully embodied within the saints in our tradition and something that um, can help us connect to God. So looking forward to doing that over the next few weeks. Well, thank you all. It's a blessing to be with you this morning, and I look forward to seeing you next week at All Saints and hopefully the week after uh, talking more about our saints and ancestors. Thank Blessings you. On your week. Thank you, guys. Bye-bye. Thank you, Lyndon. Goodbye. 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 Goodb